so yoga being a three, even 4,000 year old tradition, uh, it's now classified by NIH, um, NIH as a form of complementary and alternative medicine. And this was a, a big feat in the yoga research um, world really to get this uh, classification. And yoga is considered to be a mind body medicine that integrates the physical, the mental um, and spiritual modalities and factors in order to elevate and enhance basically overall health, um, particularly stress-related conditions, which we will get into um, for me this evening and I think for many of you in the morning. So overall, what I wanted to highlight is that the yoga, the practice of the yoga is, as many of you may already know, it, it's producing this physiological state um, that impacts the overall nervous system quite a bit. <clears throat> and one of the main impacts that is allows the autonomic nervous system to, to reorganize itself. And so before we dive uh, into more of the yoga, <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight um, a few things about Manta Health so we can really see how the yoga is an amazing tool, an amazing intervention, an amazing um, resource to develop really healthy, um, um, you know, to, to develop this good mental health. So where, what characterizes good mental health? I have a person's ability to fulfill a number of key functions. So the ability to learn, the ability to feel, express, manage a range of positive and negative emotions, the ability to form and maintain good relationships with others, and the ability to cope and manage change and uncertainty. So I wanted to highlight that in the beginning of um, our, our time here together so that as we explore the facets of yoga, you can see how yoga really does address many of the aspects of the factors of good mental health, um, because it, it, it allows um, the elements of what it means to learn. We, we focus on the, the attention and the concentration. Um, it's even been linked to memory. Um, it gets into the emotional realm. It gets into um, relationships with others based on the branches of the yoga. And it helps deal with stress management, which we'll get into. And so, I, I, again, I just wanted to highlight some of the, which many of you may already know, just the key aspects of um, mental health. DSM-5, definition of mental disorder. A mental disorder is a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior, okay? And so, again, a yoga is one of these resources that aims directly at these, um, these main facets of, of being a human, cognition, emotion, and behavior. <clears throat> so if we begin to, what I have spent time doing over the years is really exploring various holistic health models. And what came very clear to me is that yoga is uh, a, an intervention or an, and it's a um, treatment methodology, um, a modality, uh, a, a protocol that really fits into holistic health. And so I just wanted to review uh, this holistic health model just so that we have um, a little more clarity on how yoga really blends in with the, the modern context of, of medicine. So according to Edelman and Mandel, holistic health model, holism represents the interaction of a person's mind, body, and spirit. Holism is based on the belief that people and their various parts cannot be fully understood if examined solely in pieces or apart from their environment. Holism sees people as ever-changing systems of energy. <clears throat> and in this holistic health model, therapists consider their clients the ultimate experts regarding their own health. So the clients themselves hold an incredible amount of autonomy. And in this holistic health model, 
clients play a very big role in their overall healing process. So in the previous uh, um, presentation, I, I think that you dove quite deeply into the research. So I, I might dabble into it a little bit, but for today's talk, what, is, what I want to spend most of our time on is just diving into the, the, the context of yoga, the, 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 the juiciness of yoga, the elements of yoga. So what is yoga? Yoga comes from this really root word in Sanskrit, yuj. And yuj means to like a union or yoke or to join. Um, it also yuj has another reference um, in the scriptures as direct and concentrate, to direct and concentrate one's attention. And if we look at uh, more modern definitions of yoga, um, yoga includes physical postures, conscious breathing, meditation techniques, uh, the practices to enhance sensory and motor development, lifestyle and diet changes and behaviors, visualizations, and, and the use of sound. These are just um, kind of the, the foundation, but there's actually much more to the, the, the branches of, of yoga. So let's dive into where yoga is really fitting in, in regards to the philosophy of yoga. So when we look at the philosophy of yoga, there's uh, how it really fits into health and how it fits into the evolution of a, and growth of a, of a human, um, human heart, a uh, human's consciousness, um, and overall well-being and health. So we have the five koshas, and I felt that it was important to highlight the, the koshas today because the koshas represent the layers of the human. Um, kosha is a Sanskrit word that can also be translated as um, sheath. So it's the, the sheaths, the layers of the human system. And this concept, the koshas, comes out of the Upanishads, which is a very old uh, uh, yogic text um, the Vedic time period, like 6th century BC. So we're talking about some very ancient wisdom. And the koshas move from the, the physical plane to the most subtle plane. So each layer um, has its own, its own qualities. So these are the, the five primary uh, koshas. And we start actually on the outer layer, which is called the Anamaya Kosha, which is our physical layer. It's the most gross, it's the most dense. So the Anamaya Kosha is, it's our, our physical body. Um, it's the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system, the brain, it's all the organs, it's the tissue, it's the blood, it's the teeth, it's um, the ears, it's the, it's the senses. It's literally anything that um, is considered um, a, a form. And this is our, our, our outermost layer. So these koshas, they are nested within one another. Um, so it really highlights this holistic quality <clears throat> of yoga, but they also in and of themselves stand alone. So yoga really, um, <clears throat> it, it, it serves this layer quite a bit when we talk about the, um, the asana practices, which we'll get into. And then we have the, the second layer of depth, which is the energetic, layer, the energetic sheath, the pranic sheath, the pranamaya kosha. And, you know, this sheath in and of itself is, um, it has an architecture to it. It has structure to it. It has uh, energetic channels and energetic centers and um, channels and, and that, that link outside of the body, even uh, outside of the physical body. So this is a, uh, a system in and of itself that um, is intricate. It's a very intricate system. And this layer, the pranamaya kosha, has a very significant impact on the physical layer, on anamaya kosha. 
So when we have blockages in our energetic channel, it very much causes um, huge disturbances in the physical layer. And vice versa, when we have um, misalignments in the physical body or when we have disturbances or illnesses in the physical body, it disturbs the energetic body. So the prana, the energetic body, when it's free flowing and undisturbed, they say it, it plays a very big role on the cardiovascular system. So when the energy is flowing freely, the cardiovascular system is flowing freely. And then from there, we begin to see um, a big change in the physical layer. So if we go a layer deeper, we come to the manamaya kosha, which is considered the mental layer. So in the manamaya kosha, we are exploring the mind. Um, we're also exploring the emotions and many aspects of the inner world. So we have thought forms, we have um, mental processing like deductive reasoning and logic. Um, we have perceptions. We, you know, the, the personality often falls underneath this layer um, and the mental patterning. So this, this layer is um, a layer that can become very disturbed when we are under an incredible amount of dis, um, distress um, or anxiety or depression. So the, the mind gets um, busy or it gets heavy. And from there, that begins to feed its way through the energetic layer. And then from there into the physical layer. So I, I wanted to share this diagram with you and share some of these um, teachings around the koshas to show how uh, all of our layers are intricately um, woven and how yoga begins to weave its way into supporting each and every one of these koshas. And then we go to one layer deeper, which is called the Vijnanamaya kosha. And this is considered the wisdom body or the wisdom layering. It is um, awareness. It's, um, you know, the, the mind beyond the mind. It's the, the part of ourself that can witness. It's the part of ourself that observes. Um, so it's the one that has the capacity um, and the power to uh, slow the manamaya kosha down. It, it's the, the one that has the, often the innate tools to um, invite the, the mental layer um, to become less disturbed. So a lot of the, the meditation techniques that we see in, in yoga often direct them themselves to, to this kosha. And then finally, our, our center, our core uh, sheet is the Anandamaya kosha. And this is our bliss body. This is our, um, our pure consciousness, pure awareness. It's often like this considered the soul level. So this is where we begin to see expanded states of, of consciousness. And also when we can literally allow ourselves to rest in the sheath through the yoga practices, uh, the teachings of yoga uh, state that it begins to permeate itself through all the other layers. So when we're in this layer, it begins to um, clear and um, release blockages and form a um, like this wholeness and a sense of peace and this sense of um, connection and, and pure pleasure. Okay, so now, from this philosophical, philosophical lens, I really wanted to share, this is the lens of, um, you know, us being 
our own individual human self, you know? And so from this lens of these koshas, I wanted to share um, the philosophy of the eight limbs of yoga. Because the eight limbs of yoga, it's, it's basically the, it's basically the foundation of how we see yoga in the modern world. Yoga has evolved itself from this philosophy, from this theoretical foundation. And it comes from um, a very infamous text, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is uh, a text that has been described as um, a manual or a resource guide uh, to optimal health or even to enlightenment. Um, so this text <clears throat> has even by like, by psychologists and, and, and psychotherapists that we see in, in, in today's medicine, they, they find many similarities to, for example, to cognitive behavioral therapy or um, psychoanalysis techniques found in this text. So it's a, it's a text I personally turn to over and over again for practices. Uh, it's a text that I teach to uh, all teacher trainers are required to take this, um, to study this text in, in a very um, comprehensive way. And it really is, the whole text itself is, is really, uh, um, the, the foundation, the root system of, of yoga. So in this text, the eight limbs of yoga is defined. And the eight limbs of yoga is really how we have, um, you know, how yoga has grown its branches. It, it's, it's many, many branches. There's many lineages of yoga. Um, there's many types of yoga. Um, there's many sizes and colors and lineages. Um, really yoga, there's something for everybody out there. And they all kind of stem often from, from these, one of these limbs. So the, the eight limbs of yoga, it starts with, um, you know, a set of ethical principles, ethical principles for living a very meaningful and purposeful life, um, serving as a, almost like a, I'd say like a prescription um, for moral and ethical conduct and even self-discipline. Um, and they direct one's attention to health. <clears throat> and at the same time, the, the eight limbs of yoga allow a practitioner to acknowledge the spiritual aspects of one's own nature. So if we, if we start with the eight limbs, we would, we would start with the yamas and the niyamas. So what, before I, I, I dive into these fairly quickly, I just wanted to say that these limbs may be used um, separately and independently, but theoretically to highlight that the, the physical practice and the breathing practices are used, according to the, these teachings, are used as um, tools to prepare uh, the energetic body, to prepare all the sheaths for, for the meditation. So often there, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that, 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 that yoga is, um, that there's something for everybody in the yoga. And it really depends on where someone is in their journey of, of healing and where they are in health and well being. And based on certain disturbances in the physical body or disturbances in the manamaya, the mind, or in the energetic body, some people might not be ready to sit for the meditation practices. So we need to. Uh, they, they will be staying with these different branches until they are prepared for the meditation. And so 
in these eight limbs of, of yoga, the teachings of, um, tell us that even before we, we do the physical and even before we work with the breathing, we want to spend time with preparing our ethical and our moral conduct with the yamas and the niyamas. So the, the yamas and the niyamas are, um, begin to think of them like, um, like right livings or, um, or self-regulation tools um, or healthy conduct uh, in order to move forward with these practices. It's almost like these practices have prerequisites. And some of the prerequisites are setting up ourselves um, so that we have the, the, um, the resiliency, so we have the endurance, so we have the, the um, you know, in, in some lineages of yoga, they would say the darshan, like the, the, um, the, the proper lens and the proper container to be held so that we can move forward in these practices in an, in an, in an efficient and um, held way. Now, that's the, the traditional teachings. Often in modern yoga, um, a lot of this is lost, you know, um, really helping this, the, the practitioners create that, that, those ethics and healthy living so that by the time they sit down to do their practices, they're more likely to stay committed. Um, there'll be a deeper uh, understanding of what's happening to them and it will be much more progressive, the, the results, the outcome, outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. So we have the, the yamas and the niyamas. We move to the physical postures, which is the asana and also the movement. And then we have the pranayama, which is the breath control. There's many different breathing practices. Pranayama in general, um, if I had to give just a, a summary of pranayama, it is the extension of the inhales and the exhales <clears throat> and the retentions, the, the holding of the breath. And together, those two things, extending the breath and holding the breath, you'd be quite amazed by what happens to all of your sheaths um, through these very simple practices. And so traditionally, the, the, the teachers, um, such as like Krishnacharya and Deskachar, these very ancient teachers from the late 1800s into the early 1900s, um, you know, they, they would invite there to be like almost like initiations to occur so that before you were able to practice some of the asana, you know, they, they had the chance to, to get to know you in regards to your moral and ethical conduct. And then they would practice the pranayamas and, and then, then they would move into the pratyaharas, which is the withdrawal of the senses. And really just to give a little quick introduction to pratyahara, um, what, what we mean by the, the withdrawal of the senses is that we're moving our, our inward. We're moving the senses inward and the perception inward. And then after those practices are established, then we have the capacity to concentrate, dharana. And then after someone is able to literally teach their brain and their systems um, how to concentrate over an extended period of time, then we can spontaneously move into um, meditation, which is like the free flowing qualities of awareness. And then once is our, our mind has an, an awareness is at that state for an extended period of time, Diana, then we have the taste, those fleeting moments often of samadhi, which is that bliss, that oneness. So in one given class of yoga, we are floating through these different limbs of yoga. 
depending on what kind of class you are taking. Okay. To continue with some of the, the history um, of yoga and philosophy of yoga, I felt that um, it was imperative to introduce Ayurveda. So historically speaking, yoga, when it was derived and started to um, permeate through the culture and um, you know, you had the, the, the teachers and their disciples and they worked very, very, very closely with Ayurveda, um, the Ayurveda specialists and doctors. So they were considered married. Yoga and Ayurveda were like, they were the sun and the moon. They were the, um, the night and the day to make something whole. You would never introduce the yoga without the Ayurveda. It's like they were introduced together. So yoga was designed to be delivered with Ayurveda. And Ayurveda is defined um, as the science of life. Um, and it's originated in India even more, more than 5,000 years ago. It's often referred to as the mother of all healing. It places an incredible amount of emphasis on prevention and encourages the maintenance of health through finding balance in life. So balance and harmony are kind of the key attributes of our, um, Ayurveda, uh, including right thinking. So how to work with thought patterns and how to work with the mind in general diet, lifestyle, habits, and routines, and the use of herbs. So Ayurveda focuses on seasons, on cycles, on constitutions, <clears throat> and the primary elements in nature. So I really wanted to put that out there now because I feel this is something that has been lost in, in the evolution of yoga in, in the modern field. And now when teachers are in their training and they are required to take Ayurveda, however, um, depending on how long a teacher has trained, the more they trained, the, the more Ayurveda they will take. And uh, I, I personally feel that the standards that are out there, I, I feel in a way I'd love for them to be increased a little bit in regards to the Ayurveda. Um, for the yoga teachers, because I, I feel it's very important for the, the teachers of yoga, the therapists of yoga to um, have not just, um, you know, the, the intellectual knowledge of Ayurveda, but also the experiential knowledge so that they themselves are practicing the habits um, in their daily life so that they can uh, help their teacher trainers um, to also embody it and, and to share this with, with clients. <clears throat> okay, so what is yoga? One thing that yoga definitely is, is, uh, the, is, is stress management. And so we see that in the research. Stress contributes to the uh, etiology of many diseases, including heart disease, cancer, and stroke, which many of us already know this. But yoga itself has been shown to reduce um, the negative impacts of stress uh, on physical, mental, and emotional states in order to reduce the burden of disease. So viewed as a holistic stress management technique, yoga is a form of CAM, that produces a sequence of events in the body, a sequence of physiological events. Um, and it, it reduces the, the stress response. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is that if it's, if it's reducing the, the stress response, it is, it is, is inducing the relaxation response. It, it also helps reorganize the autonomic, the autonomic nervous system so that the, the nervous system itself knows how to recover 
from, from stress. It is so that, you know, being human is stressful. So we, we, our stress response um, is, is triggered just by the demands of, of life in the modern um, society. However, the human system is not designed for chronic stress. It's, it's, it's not. Um, it is designed for a little bit of stress. And so the autonomic nervous system knows how to, yeah, we go into stress and then it comes out of stress. It releases the trauma of the stress when we have a healthy nervous system. But when we're under chronic stress, which our, our society basically um, is operating in, then what happens is the system becomes very disorganized and it doesn't know how to drop down and release the stress, um, release the trauma. And so it's, it becomes stuck. But yoga, it teaches the system how to, how to reorganize itself, how to move, to move into the relaxation response. So the parasympathetic nervous system. And many of you may already know qualities of the system, but I'll just name a few. I mean, the breath, the respiration, and the heart rate decrease. It lowers the blood pressure. It lowers cortisol and um, adrenaline in the bloodstream. Um, it increases serotonin. Um, it increases blood flow to the vital organs. Um, and therefore, from there, impacts immunity, um, digestion, um, sleep patterns, uh, endocrinology. Um, so it's also been shown when we drop into the parasympathetic, the relaxation response, that it supports our response to fear or, um, or aggression so that we have this self-regulation capacity. Um, the relaxation response is also associated with the pleasure principle and the relaxation response um, inhibits the, the, the fight and flight. And so it, it has been shown to lower anxiety le levels. So this is a very, very key principle of, of the yoga, the relaxation response. Now, the question is, are, are the yoga classes, are the, the treatment modalities of yoga incorporating appropriate practices so that the relaxation response is uh, induced? Because specific yo yoga practices will induce the relaxation response, um, not all of them. Okay, so yoga as a stress management tool. Um, yoga has also been shown. So I'm going to share a little bit of research. We just finished an amazing presentation on, on yoga and research. So I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of what's been found out there. Um, so it's been shown to create a sense of well-being. Yoga has shown to improve self-confidence, uh, <clears throat> increase attentiveness, lower irritability, and it creates an optimistic outlook on life. So it's been shown to increase optimism. And another big piece of the yoga, and it's often part of specific lineages of yoga, but when we, when we join in certain lineages or when we even attend yoga classes continuously, what the research is showing is that it connects people with community. It connects people with like-minded individuals um, to help manage stress, promote better self-care and improve overall quality of life. So um, community and social support has been shown to um, have a big impact on mental health. And so the, the yoga community has um, been shown to have um, keep drawing people back to the practices. It's been one, uh, in a lot of the qualitative research, that has been one um, of the primary um, feedback from the clients that the community has been very important for them. 
so yeah, just to continue with the, some more of the benefits, um, we, ha we have seen that it's <clears throat> build strength and flexibility in the body and the primary joints of the body, um, which is supporting the cartilage and it's gonna support the tissue and the, the overall fascial system. It's been shown to reduce back pain, um, eases arthritis, and supports a healthy heart, including high blood pressure, um, stress reduction, as I just went into, and even excess weight. Some more physical benefits um, is been shown in the research to improve sleep, um, to increase energy levels, and to create um, brighter moods. So the mood levels um, has been shown to improve digestion and reduce inflammation. <clears throat> Okay, so just to continue with some of these amazing benefits of the yoga, that it helps develop a sharper brain. So studies show that yoga therapy can help manage and reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression. So uh, yoga has been researched um, so quite substantially. Um, the research has been like a, a substantial increase in the, the last few, you know, last decade. And there's been a lot of research done on the anxiety, anxiety and depression. So we know it works. And also the brain cells are developing new connections from many of the yoga practices. And the brain structure has been shown to even, even change over an extended period of time and how it functions, um, including the cognitive skills. So impacting learning and memory. So now that's where we can see uh, yoga really popping up in the school systems. In fact, just last year, I was on a team and I was also doing this in Vancouver, really implementing yoga into the school systems. Um, so school systems have been showing um, how the yoga has a very big impact in the classroom. I mean, not only does it help the children um, focus and concentrate, but it also adds a lot more um, uh, ease uh, within, with amongst the kids and how they're, they're communicating with the teachers. And so it's just been having such a huge impact that the schools are really begging for it to be in there. So I just spent some time the last few years um, training some teachers and really putting the yoga into the schools uh, here in Spain. And we were doing that in Vancouver when I was lead, when I left. So yoga can also help manage neurological disorders. Some of the research was showing that it has, uh, has had an impact on epilepsy, stroke, um, MS, Alzheimer's, um, fibromyalgia, just to name a few. Uh, also motor and sensory develop, development. So yoga um, through a lot of the practices, especially the asana, has been shown to have um, a big impact on dexterity. So the ability to push and pull and grab and release and lift and jump and skip, you know. So we can see how it plays a very big role with physical therapy for people that are recovering from injuries. Um, and it plays a very big role with um, dis people that have disabilities, motor disabilities or sensory disabilities. Um, or just young children in general who are developing their dexterity skills. And then we have um, somatic knowledge, which is like this internal um, perception. So yoga helps um, really develop this capacity to connect to your internal sensory system so that uh, we can move forward with discernment and appropriate decision-making in, in our lifestyle routines and lifestyle habits. Uh, the yoga also has a very big role on proprioception, kinesia, um, kinesiology, like the body's ability to sense its location, to sense its movement, to sense its action. Um, so I've spent a, a lot of time working with seniors and it's been quite amazing for me to see the development of their proprioception over an extended period of time. 
and how it gives them the sense of confidence and freedom in their body just by understanding where they are and helping them with balance. <clears throat> Again, this is also plays a very big role with, with kids who are developing the proprioception. Um, proprioception is a, a part of ourself that is, is developing as our nervous system is developing and our brain is developing. And then we have interoception. And interoception is um, the sense of like the internal state of the body. So proprioception is how our body is in space and interoception is, um, you know, our, 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 our internal system. Interoception is like we have sensors all through our physiological body. So we have the, these little receptors in your cardiovascular system in your gastrointestinal system in your immune system and your endocrine system. And they're little sensors that are constantly communicating with all your sheets at an unconscious level, but there's also a consciousness to it. There's actually um, a visceral felt sense that yoga helps to develop. So yoga is helping um, at, at the motor and sensory level quite a bit. And, and finally, I just wanted to highlight a few, um, you know, if it, if it was up to me, I, I would love yoga to, you know, really be put out there at a level um, that supported um, masses, you know, the masses. And I think for it to be, um, <clears throat> because I do think it's a, an intervention that truly is accessible to everyone because yoga has a, such a broad range of um, practices um, and branches and lineages that there's something for everybody. And so what I wanted to highlight here is yoga for health promotion and disease prevention. And I, to, to just give a little highlight of health promotion, health promotion is a process of empowering people to increase control over their health. Disease prevention aims to minimize the burden of diseases and associated risk factors. And so factors of health promotion, um, medical, behavioral change, education, client-centered and community. And I, I highlight this because there are, yoga is a, is a modality, it's a, um, um, a treatment methodology that can be aimed um, in the medical realm for behavioral change, most definitely for education, education about health um, and autonomy in someone's well being. It's client centered so that it's adapted to meet individual needs. And it most definitely is a um, methodology that embraces community. So I just wanted to end this evening to, um, yeah, encourage and, you know, basically propose yoga as a modality for health promotion and disease prevention. And so thank you very much for joining me this evening. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, to be here for you. And you can also feel free to email me. And I am the, the founder of Bindu Institute for Learning, which is quite new, is launched in the summer. It's an online, but also in-person learning institute. We're launching um, the departments slowly, department by department, um, but overall be an institute of health sciences uh, and Eastern medicines. So, we have launched um, so far the yoga department, the Ayurveda department, and then anatomy and physiology department. And we still have to launch um, the mystical arts department, the meditation department, the women's studies department, holistic medicine department. So we'll be slowly launching the school over the next couple of years. But I encourage you to come check us out and we offer classes online as well as in person.